wondering. It's late autumn, 1901, in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Franklin Tarbell stands on a wooden platform in a railroad station. His gray beard juts out from a thick woolen scarf as Tarbell cranes his neck, trying to spot the incoming train. The tracks extend for miles, eventually disappearing in the horizon. Tarbell cracks his knuckles and exhales. Then he finds a seat and waits for the train that will bring home his daughter, Ida. Franklin is anxious to see his daughter. These days she lives in New York City. She's making a name for herself as a journalist and as an editor of a magazine called McClure's. But recently she wrote home with a message that raised Franklin's concerns. She said she was coming back to Titusville and that she had some important news. Franklin Tarbell dips his head, waiting anxiously for the train to arrive. He hopes his daughter is all right, that she's healthy and happy. Maybe he thinks she's coming home to share some exciting news, something to celebrate. In the distance, a train whistle cuts through the cold air. Franklin Tarbell looks up and sees plumes of thick black smoke. A few moments later, the train arrives at the station and comes to a screeching halt. Franklin searches the platform as the passengers disembark. Then he sees his daughter, Ida, as she steps down from a train car. She's wearing a wide hat with a sloping brim. Franklin nearly tears up. It feels like just yesterday she was a girl. Now Ida's a grown woman with her own life. The two catch each other's eyes. Then they race forward and embrace in a tight hug. Franklin pulls back and takes a long look at Ida. Oh my, look at you. You look well. The big city must suit you. Maybe it does. But most days I don't see much of New York. Not more than I can see from my writing desk. Well then, it seems that writing suits you. All right, shall we? Franklin takes Ida's bag. Then the two leave the train station together and begin walking back toward the house. As they head back along the dirt path, Franklin steals a nervous glance at Ida. You mentioned you have some news? Yes, big news. Exciting news. I started working on a new assignment from McClure's. I think you'll be very interested in it. Oh, a magazine piece. I, I thought oh, I thought something had happened. Well, of course. All right, tell me. What's this piece about? It's an investigation of Standard Oil. Franklin stops in his tracks. He stares at his daughter and tries to fight down a rising panic. Ida reaches and grabs his hand. Father, are you all right? No. Ida, listen to me. You cannot write that story. Why not? I don't understand. You know why not. You've seen what Standard Oil did to this town. Rockefeller has no principles. God, he's an evil man. If he gets wind that you're investigating him, he'll come after you. Do not take this risk. Don't be ridiculous. It's a magazine article. No one will probably even read it. That's my biggest fear, not John D. Rockefeller. And besides, I have support from all my colleagues. Ida, Rockefeller has all the money and power in the world. He can ruin you. He can ruin the magazine if you want. Please, listen to me. I'm proud of you. But do not make the same mistake I did. Do not take on standard. You will not win that fight. Franklin looks pleadingly at his daughter, breathing hard. But she doesn't flinch. I understand. But you need to understand something, too. This story is far bigger than me or you. It's bigger than Titusville. The American people have a right to know the truth. They need to see how one company took control of the entire oil supply. Franklin looks at his daughter and feels a bittersweet mixture of fear and pride. I don't suppose it would have mattered what I said. We would have kept on working on the story anyway, wouldn't you? Ida nods. And before she can say another word, Franklin wraps her in a hug. He holds onto her tight, and he doesn't want to let go. Because once he does, he knows he won't be able to protect her, not from what she's facing. So Franklin doesn't try to stop her. He straightens up, wipes his nose, then he steps back and takes another look at Ida. It's then when he realizes he doesn't want to stop her. Maybe she will win the fight. Maybe she's the one who someday will take down John D. Rockefeller. American Scandal is sponsored by the new Audible original Bad Republican by Meghan McCain. In her debut audio memoir, Meghan McCain gives a first-hand look into the life of the conservative rebel and departing co-host of The View. You'll hear what it's like to grow up as the daughter of an American icon and to mourn his loss very publicly just one year into her tenure as co-host of America's most-watched daytime talk show. Her memoir also reveals how she handled attacks from the U.S. president and her thoughts on cancel culture, dating, and how our country treats new mothers. It's unsparingly honest, deeply relatable, and highly entertaining. Go beyond what you know about Meghan McCain from TV and your newsfeed. Visit audible.com slash bad Republican and listen now. We get support from the new podcast, Hemingway's Picasso. Stephen Coe lived many lives. He was an NFL journeyman, a male model, and one of the most well-connected smugglers in 1980s Miami. Coe collected many souvenirs from his adventures, but his most treasured bounty, a beautiful ceramic crafted by Pablo Picasso and gifted to Ernest Hemingway at the author's Cuban home. So the story goes. Lost during the Cuban Revolution, the artwork resurfaced when Coe took it as payment for a drug run financed by the notorious Pablo Escobar. Coe passed away in 2018, passing the piece down to his son, Stevie. Stevie feels he needs to complete his father's mission of selling this piece and telling Steve's cinematic life story. Is the Picasso authentic or a fraud? Was Steve Coe a big talker or a real deal smuggler? Listen to new episodes of Hemingway's Picasso every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Skin. In 1901, Ida Tarbell began researching her landmark series on Standard Oil. At the time, the public knew almost nothing about Standard Oil, a company that reigned supreme over America's petroleum supply. Rival oil companies had complained loudly about Standard's cutthroat tactics, but for the most part, John D. Rockefeller was able to create his monopoly without public scrutiny. 
there was only a small group of people who understood the true scale of the company's profits and its power, the company's own executives. Ida Tarbell knew she was taking on an ambitious investigation. But as she struggled to uncover the truth about Standard Oil, she received help from unexpected sources, including members of Rockefeller's inner circle. Soon, Tarbell's series would launch in the pages of McClure's magazine, and Rockefeller would see the dark secrets of his past brought to light. This is Episode 4, The Hunt. It's early winter 1901. In Lower Manhattan, a cold rain beats against the arched windows of the Astor Library. Ida Tarbell rushes in from the street. She takes off her wet coat and lets down her hair. She rubs her hands together and tries to warm them up from the frigid air outside. As she looks around this ornate lobby, she notices a librarian with a neatly trimmed beard, a man who's staring at her, scowling. He dips his glasses and clears his throat. Then he tells Tarbell that if she's looking for somewhere warm, there's shelter down the street. This isn't a refuge for wayward women. Tarbell has been to a lot of courthouses and a lot of research libraries. Usually, she ignores the disapproving comments she gets from men. But she's cold and exhausted, and today she's had enough. She marches up to the front desk and informs the librarian she has important business. She has an appointment with his supervisor, Adelaide Haas. The man blinks, then rises and says he'll go fetch her. As Tarbell waits, she gazes across the leather-bound books in the library shelves. She wonders what secrets they might hold. Months ago, Tarbell dove headfirst into her investigation of Standard Oil. She's combed through decades of material, and yet she still hasn't been able to find one crucial document. That's why she's here today in this library. Adelaide Haas is one of the most respected research librarians in the country. Tarbell hopes she can work a miracle and help find this one elusive document. Tarbell hears a pair of footsteps approaching. She turns and finds a woman walking toward her, wearing a dark green dress with a high collar. The woman reaches out a hand and introduces herself as Adelaide Haas. She asks how she can help. Tarbell glances at the male librarian sitting behind the front desk. Then she lowers her voice and explains what she's here for, the original charter of the South Improvement Company. Tarbell explains that this was a controversial deal that Standard Oil struck with the railroads. Standard would get rebates to ship its products, and this would drive its competitors out of business. But Tarbell explains, without proof of this agreement, her entire investigation could fall apart. She fears that Standard, or the railroads, have destroyed all copies of their charter. Haas is quiet for a moment as she stares into the distance. Then she looks back at Tarbell and grins. Haas says it's very hard to completely erase a piece of public information, especially a document at the heart of so much controversy. Tarbell nods, her eyes lighting up. She agrees there has been a lot of controversy. In fact, the New York State Legislature was investigating Standard Oil. Haas taps her foot, thinking. Then she turns back to Tarbell and says she has an idea. She might be able to track down this charter and prove that Standard Oil colluded with the railroads. Before Tarbell can ask another question, Haas takes off, walking toward the archives, and Tarbell follows quickly after. Soon the two wend their way through the dimly lit stacks. They're surrounded on all sides by thick leather books. Tarbell feels her heart in her throat. She's hoping this could be it. She's hoping this could be the break she's been waiting for. Haas turns a corner and then steps onto a wooden ladder attached to the shelves. Halfway up, she runs her fingers over the spines of several books. Finally, she plucks one out and returns to the ground. Haas hands the book to Tarbell with a satisfied smile. Tarbell's hands tremble as she flips through the pages. She stops when she lands on one page with bold letters at the top. She looks up at Haas in astonishment. It's the charter for the South Improvement Company. Tarbell feels her heart swelling with gratitude and a sense of urgency. This is the document that started it all, the scheme that drove her father to become a vigilante 30 years ago. Finally, she has proof of Standard Oil's corruption. Now she needs to share it with the world and let everyone know the truth about Standard Oil. It's January 1902. Ida Tarbell stands on the front steps of a four-story brownstone in midtown Manhattan. She stares up to the top of this mansion, which seems to reach toward the sky. Cold wind rushes through the hedges, and Tarbell clutches her notebook. She takes a deep breath, then steps forward and knocks on the large oak door. For Ida Tarbell, today is the culmination of months of work. She's poured over documents on Standard Oil's history. She's begun to connect the dots, understanding just how the company grew so big and crushed the competition so ruthlessly. After hours of research, Tarbell has become very familiar with the executives who run Standard Oil, but she's only been able to piece together their stories from court transcripts and charter documents. Today will be her first time meeting one of these men in person. Tarbell stands on the front steps of the mansion, waiting. A minute passes, and Tarbell begins to worry. Maybe the meeting is off. Maybe her source has decided not to talk. But as her fears are about to get the best of her, a butler opens the door. Tarbell straightens her back and tells the butler she's here to see Henry Rogers. The butler nods. He welcomes her into the house and steps aside. As Tarbell marvels at the elegant foyer, she can't believe her luck. Henry Rogers is the director of the Standard Oil Trust, and he recently contacted Tarbell through their mutual friend, Mark Twain. Rogers says he caught wind of her investigation, and he wanted to give Standard Oil side of the story. Tarbell knows he may try to spin the truth but she also hopes he'll provide far more interesting details than she can get from dusty papers in an archive. The butler leads Tarbell up a wide stairway. He shows her into a library, where a man is seated in a velvet chair. His back is turned to the door. The butler knocks, and the man rises, turning to face them. He has a white, drooping mustache and lively eyes that put Tarbell at ease. He approaches Tarbell and greets her. Miss Tarbell, Henry Rogers, so pleased to make your acquaintance. We have a lot to discuss, but before we begin, I have to ask, are you related to Franklin Tarbell, the man who ran Tarbell's barrel shop in Rouseville? This catches Tarbell off guard, as she flashes back to memories of her life in Rouseville during the Civil War. Yes, Franklin is my father. Ah, I knew the man. I lived just across the way from your family. Ah, I must have seen you on the hillside when you were a young girl. Uh, maybe perhaps you were picking flowers. 
Tarble can't help but feel a warm glow as she remembers her childhood there. But then she snaps back and composes herself. This is an old trick. Rogers is trying to charm her. He's a businessman, and he'll do whatever it takes to influence the story. But Tarble also knows two can play at this game. Mr. Rogers, what a lovely memory. I am from so long ago, and yet you don't look a day over 40. <coughs> well, you can stop that now. Nothing's farther from the truth. Unfortunately, I'm a journalist, and every fiber in my body keeps me from telling a lie. Mr. Rogers, may I? Tarble gestures to a chair, and Rogers welcomes her to take a seat. As she does, and she smooths her long skirt, she notices that Rogers is blushing. That's good. Now she has the upper hand. I know you're a busy man, so can I tell you about the story I'm researching? I hear you've been working on it for some time. But you haven't spoken yet with anyone at Standard. Do I have that right? You do. Yes, it's, uh, it's been tedious so far. I've had to sift through page after page of old documents. Yes, that does sound tedious. Charters and articles of incorporation. Uh, <laughs> there's no humanity in those scraps of paper. You understand exactly right. And let me be completely transparent. My goal is to present my readers with a fair portrait of Standard. The truth is what I'm after. Rogers crosses his legs and smiles as he twirls his finger through his mustache. Mm, the truth. That's the most important pursuit in the world. I couldn't agree more. You know, when I was a girl back in Roundsville, I wanted to be a scientist. That profession was off limits to me as a woman, but I found a real calling as a writer. Science. Miss Tarbell, you do seem driven toward the more noble pursuits. I should say Standard Oil does its fair share of scientific work, which makes me wonder, are you still interested in science? Of course I am. Well, then would you be willing to come to Standard Headquarters? I'd like to continue this discussion there. You can meet some other senior executives, and you can see a real juggernaut of science and industry right up close. That way, you can tell a story about us that's true and right. Tarbell's heart begins to beat fast. She's shocked, amazed at the sudden turn of events. Mr. Rogers, I'd love that. I'll speak to as many of your people as are willing. I'm sure this will give me a much more complete picture of Standard. Ida Tarble rises and straightens her skirt. Rogers walks her to the door, and a moment later the butler leads her out of the mansion and back out into the cold January air. Tarble stands on the front steps of Henry Rogers Brownstone, her mind spinning with a sense of possibility. This conversation was a massive success. Soon she'll be inside the belly of the octopus, whose tentacles have crushed the rest of the oil industry, and she'll be that much closer to exposing the lies and corruption of Standard Oil. It's several months later in New York City. Today, the offices of McClure's magazine are filled with frantic activity. Writers and editors pace the room. They argue about headlines and quotes, commas, and captions. Yet Ida Tarbell sits motionless at her desk. She's trying to remain calm. Within hours, the magazine's November issue is supposed to hit the printers. And it has a major story, the first installment of Tarbell's series on Standard Oil. But right now, they're down to the wire. S.S. McClure, the magazine's founder, is reading Tarbell's story once again. He says it's the most important story the magazine has ever published, and he wants every word to be perfect. Tarbell is nervous. She can feel her hands growing moist, her forehead damp. What if McClure decides to kill the story? What if he gives in to everyone else's fears that John D. Rockefeller will go after them? Tarbell has no doubt about it. Rockefeller will have many reasons to be angry. She's interviewed all the men in the oil regions who fought Standard and lost. She met with Henry Rogers, and the executive simply handed over information about the company's practices. And finally, her story doesn't mince words. Rockefeller comes away looking greedy and cruel, and the company he built comes off just as badly. Tarbell rises and begins pacing around her desk. She looks at the clock. They're running out of time. If they don't send over the manuscript now, the story could die before it even had a chance. She wipes the sweat from her forehead. But just then, S.S. McClure emerges from his office. He waves Tarbell's manuscript above his head and shouts for the entire office to gather around. The whole room goes quiet, and McClure tells Tarbell and her colleagues that the story is brilliant. She's taken the complex question of monopolies, a question essential to the future of the country, and brought it to readers clearly and vividly, and above all, accurately. The McClure staff erupts in cheers and congratulations. Tarbell smiles and nearly stumbles over in happy exhaustion. Then she thinks of John D. Rockefeller, the man whose corruption she's about to expose. The question is, once her story hits the newsstands, how will he fight back? In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. These were secrets that, once uncovered, would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the attacks of September 11th, but I don't want to talk about that day. I want to talk about the next day, and every day after that. I'm Dan Taberski. I'm the host of the podcast 912. Hear stories about how 9-11 the day became 9-11 the idea. 912 is available now on Amazon Music. It's the spring of 1903 in Cleveland, Ohio. John D. Rockefeller is walking through his private gardens alongside one of his lifelong friends. This stroll was supposed to be pleasant, a time to get some sunshine. But Rockefeller can't help but notice a troubled look on his friend's face. Rockefeller waits for the man to speak. His friend hesitates, takes a deep breath. Then he looks Rockefeller in the eyes and pleads with him to speak out against Ida Tarbell. Every month, McClure's runs another damning story about Standard Oil. Rockefeller has to do something. 
Otherwise, Tarble is going to ruin Standard's reputation and Rockefeller's good name. Rockefeller looks down and shakes his head. He feels pity for his friend, who just doesn't understand business. It's then Rockefeller notices a small earthworm wriggling onto freshly clipped grass. Rockefeller points to the worm, telling his friend that if he steps on that worm, he'll call attention to it. But if he ignores it, the worm will disappear back into the earth. Ida Tarble is no different, Rockefeller says. She'll make her fuss. Soon she'll be forgotten. Rockefeller's friend begins to speak and tries to challenge this argument. But Rockefeller silences him and tells him to watch the worm. It wriggles on the grass for a moment, but then soon it disappears into the soil. Rockefeller shoots his friend a satisfied grin. He gestures with his hands, pointing to the wide, beautiful lawn. See all this, Rockefeller says. These gardens are standard oil. They're a magnificent creation. No one who visits here would remember a worm that crawled through them. A few months later, the offices of McClure's magazine are quiet and dark. All the desks are empty, except for one in the corner where Ida Tarble sits by the light of an electric lamp. Right now, Tarble is waiting to meet a new source for a story. The man wrote her a letter and said he's an independent oil refiner who could help expose Standard Oil. But he insisted they meet at night. He was terrified of what might happen if Standard discovered he was providing her with information. Tarble checks the clock. It's after midnight and the oil refiner is hours late. But Tarble isn't tired. Her series on Standard Oil has been a huge success. Each installment is drawing more readers and more attention. And that's given Tarble the fuel to keep pushing forward, even late into the night. A few minutes later, Tarble hears heavy footsteps in the stairwell. There's a knock on the office door. Tarble takes a deep breath and opens it. A tall man looms in the shadows of the landing. He has a gray beard and holds a thick leather suitcase. He looks old, worn down. He doesn't seem like a threat, so Tarble invites him in. The refiner takes a seat, and right away he says he has some evidence to share with Tarble. It comes from one of his friends who worked for Standard Oil and whose job was to burn company records. One day, the friend was throwing documents into the fire when he found something suspicious. The dim light cast shadows across his anguished face. Tarble gives him a nod and asks him to explain what was on those papers. The man reaches down and lifts the suitcase into his lap. He opens it and turns it towards Tarble. It's filled to the brim. Tarble begins scanning the papers as the refiner continues with his story. He says that for years, his oil refining business was full of frustrations. He'd start to make progress in a new market, and suddenly Standard would rush in and undercut his prices. Half of the time, his shipments didn't even arrive at their destinations. It didn't make sense until he read these papers. Tarble continues reading through the documents, and then suddenly her eyes go wide. In front of her is a letter from Standard Headquarters. It's directed to a railroad shipping agent and urges him to cancel a shipment. But that shipment wasn't a Standard Oil shipment. It was a delivery order by the man sitting in front of her. Tarble grabs more documents, her eyes racing across them. She finds bookkeeping records from Standard Oil's competitors, memos detailing the inner workings of other companies, plans to undercut these competitors to steal their business. Taken together, these papers prove something astounding. Standard Oil has been running a spy network for years. Not only that, but Standard is using espionage to crush its competitors. Tarble looks up, her jaw hanging open. This is the biggest, most shocking revelation yet. The refiner gives a sad smile and rises. He tells Tarble he has to get going and makes his way to the door. Tarble calls out after him. He stops and turns around. And Tarble tells him that she now understands why he was so nervous to come forward. But he was brave to do so. And because he did, he's going to help countless other people like him, business owners who suffered terribly and never understood why. The refiner nods and tips his hat. He gives her another sad smile and tells Tarble he hopes she's right. It's August 1903 in New York City. Ida Tarble follows his secretary down a hallway inside the Standard Oil headquarters. Right now, Tarble is on her way to meet with Henry Rogers, the director of the Standard Oil Trust. For nearly two years, Tarble has had a cordial relationship with Rogers. But Tarble imagines that's about to change, now that her latest story has hit the newsstands. It details everything she learned that night when she met the refiner. Tarble is sure that Rogers will be furious. The secretary shows Tarble into Rogers' office, then instantly disappears. Before Tarble can say a word, Rogers rises from his desk and shakes the latest issue of McClure's in Tarble's direction. He demands to know where she found this material about espionage and corruption. Tarble calmly reminds Rogers that she doesn't reveal her sources. She also reminds him that he's always denied any corporate espionage. She asks, has that changed? Rogers slams the magazine down on his desk. He tells Tarble that he's always helped her, that she owes him the courtesy of not running such a story. She's made him and his company look like criminals. But Tarble shakes her head and says she has only one allegiance, to the truth. Roger's face is now red with rage. He barks at her, droplets spit flying from his mouth, and he tells Tarble to leave and never contact him again. Tarble nods calmly, then leaves the office and makes her way back outside. She inhales deeply, smelling the mix of salt water and soot from New York's harbor. She's sorry to lose Rogers as a source, but she knows her investigation will continue. America is gripped by her stories, and so right now, she's the one with leverage. The only question now is, how can she finally get in the same room as John D. Rockefeller? It's October 1903. A crowd has gathered outside a Gothic stone church in Cleveland, Ohio, whispering to one another, their eyes fixed on the church's entryway. Ida Tarble pushes her way through the onlookers. She glances to her right, where a short man trails beside her. His name is John Sadal, and he's Tarble's research assistant from McClure's magazine. Sadal bounces on his feet as he walks. He's a bundle of energy, and normally Tarble loves that quality. He's been invaluable as her eyes and ears in Cleveland. But right now, she's worried that he's going to attract attention. And attention is the last thing she needs. For nearly two years, Tarble has been investigating John D. Rockefeller and publishing article after article about Standard Oil. And it seems like all of America is reading her stories. Even President Teddy Roosevelt sent her a congratulatory note and urged her to keep going with her series. 
but that's made her an enemy of John D. Rockefeller. The rumor is Rockefeller has instructed his armed security force not to let Tarbell anywhere near him. Yet Ida Tarbell knows that at some point she has to meet Rockefeller in person. That's why she's here this morning. This is Rockefeller's church, the same church he's been attending since he was a boy. Now, Ida Tarbell wants to get up close and face the man she's been investigating. Tarbell and Sadal push through the crowd, and Tarbell shoots him a glance. Are you sure there's not some other way we can see Rockefeller? What else have you tried? I'm telling you, there's no other way. There has to be. There has to be. I mean, does it really come to this? We're going to ambush the man in church? Every Sunday at church, that's the only time he shows his face in public. Otherwise, he's locked up in his mansion the entire time. Besides, we're not ambushing him. We're just here to observe. Well, yeah, okay. But look over there, though. We have to make sure they don't observe us. Tarbell nods her head toward a large man in a heavy coat. He looks like he could be one of Rockefeller's undercover security agents. They're known to carry weapons. Tarbell can't imagine what they'd do if they saw her. Hmm. You think he's... Uh, get down. The large man begins turning toward Tarbell and Sadal, and right away Tarbell grabs her assistant and yanks him toward the ground. The two crouch and squat among the dirty shoes and torn socks of all the onlookers. Sadal's eyes go wide. You think he saw us? I don't know, and I don't want to find out, so let's just keep going. Tarbell lowers the brim of her hat, and Sadal lowers his. Together, the two continue inching toward the church. Soon, they reach the entrance. They step into a large room with stained glass windows and take their seats off to the side. Tarbell leans over and whispers to her sister. I can't get my mind around Rockefeller as a Christian. It doesn't fit with everything we've uncovered. He probably comes here every Sunday and thinks he's warded off the devil for another week. The man is a hypocrite. I'm quite sure that he's... Sadal stops and elbows Tarbell in the ribs. Huh. He's right there. Tarbell turns and stifles a gasp. It's him, John D. Rockefeller, there's no doubt about it. But while Tarbell expected she might feel rage or indignation, right now she's feeling something else entirely. She's sick to her stomach. The figure standing in the doorway looks like the oldest man she's ever seen. His mouth is a thin slit and he's completely hairless. Rockefeller doesn't even have eyebrows. Tarbell had heard about Rockefeller's condition, but it's another thing to see it in person. She's struck by the terrible thought that he looks like a walking corpse. Tarbell watches as he moves to a seat overlooking the entire room. Despite his appearance, Rockefeller somehow still exudes an incredible power. Every head turns to follow him. Rockefeller begins to address the room, speaking about Christian values. Tarbell shakes her head. She still can't help but wonder how a man can go to church every Sunday and bludgeon his opponents the rest of the week. Tarbell wants to understand the man, to get inside his head, but more than anything, she wants to take down Standard Oil and punish Rockefeller for his mistakes. As Tarbell watches Rockefeller speak, she takes mental note of every wrinkle on his face, of his sharp, pointed nose. She'll use these details like ammunition in her writing. Unlike Rockefeller, she doesn't have armed security forces standing beside her, but she knows she has something much more powerful, her mind and her fountain pen. It's January 1904 in Cleveland, Ohio. Ida Tarbell walks down Euclid Avenue and keeps her head low. Her hair is pinned up beneath a bowler hat, and she's wearing a man's long frock coat. She feels strange dressing in disguise as a man, but she's about to interview an important source, one who demanded she wear a disguise. The interview is with Frank Rockefeller, the brother of John D. Rockefeller. Frank said he didn't want his servants or his own family to know he was speaking with Tarbell. He said he was taking a great risk, and he wanted to show her documents that would incriminate his brother. Tarbell straightens her hat and then enters an office building. She checks her watch. It's 15 minutes past noon. Frank Rockefeller chose this time because his clerks would be at lunch and they wouldn't be seen. Tarbell reaches Frank's suite and knocks on the door. Frank Rockefeller stands in the doorway, his cheeks flushed. He smells like stale alcohol. Frank quickly waves Tarbell inside. As she enters, she removes her hat, releasing a dark tendril of hair. Frank laughs at the sight and slams the door. <laughs> well, good disguise. Did anyone see you? No, Mr. Rockefeller, I took every precaution. Good, good, sit there. We have much to discuss and not much time. Frank slouches into a plush leather armchair, and Tarbell sits down on a wooden bench. She opens a notebook and takes out a pen. Well, let's get right to it, then. Tell me about these documents, the papers about your brother. My brother? That man is no brother than me. He is a vile, evil individual. He ruined me. And the American public should know. Write that down. He ruined me. Tarbell jots down a note, but she also makes a mental note. She'll need to carefully guide this conversation and not let it get out of control. I'm sure your story would make for an important article. But so would these documents. You know, I've read every one of your articles. Some two or three times. Well, thank you. I'm flattered. I've tried to speak with John, but he refuses. I'm only trying to tell the truth. Well, here's all the truth you need to know. The man is delusional. He believes God has appointed him to administer the wealth of the world. So he believes he has the power to destroy men left and right. That's why you need to tell my story. Well, I'd be happy to, Mr. Rockefeller. But please, I must ask that you share the documents you promised. Frank points to a large box sitting on his desk. There they are. Take them on your way out. They prove everything I'm telling you. The important thing to know is that John stole my stock in the company. He steals from anyone he can. The man is a monster. He deserves to die. Frank then puts his head in his hands. Tarbell doesn't know what to say. She knew Rockefeller was cold-hearted, but she never imagined such hatred from his own brother. She starts to speak, but Frank suddenly springs from his chair. Yeah, yeah, leave now. I cannot be seen with you. If I am, he'll do even more to take me down. Just take the documents and go. Tarbell nods, then stands quickly and puts her hair back up under the hat. She lifts the heavy box of documents, and a moment later makes her way out of the building. 
As she walks down the street, clutching the box, she suddenly feels overwhelmed with a wave of pity and exhaustion. Two brothers should never hate each other with such ferocity. She has a duty to tell the truth, and so she'll read the documents and report the facts, but she won't relish telling this part of the story, the story of brothers who turned against each other. It's a terrible shame, but Ida Tarbell knows that she has to keep going. She must do whatever she can to finally take down Standard Oil. It's July 1905 in Cleveland, Ohio. The Sunday morning service at the Euclid Avenue Baptist Church has just ended, and John D. Rockefeller stands in the church's center aisle greeting his fellow parishioners. It's hot inside the building, and Rockefeller presses a linen handkerchief to his forehead. His damp suit hangs heavily on his thin frame. But Rockefeller is in no hurry to leave. He relishes this moment. He's known many of these families since he was a poor 14-year-old boy. Church is the only place he can feel comfortable in public, ever since Ida Tarbell began publishing her venomous articles and rallying the public against him. Yes, it's been a long year for Rockefeller. He knows that he's quickly becoming a villain in the public's imagination. Americans now see him as inhumane, corrupt, driven by an insatiable desire to crush his opponents and make as much money as possible. The caricature makes Rockefeller snort with disgust. Yet, it's not just some imaginary version of himself that he now has to confront. Government leaders have begun to take action, too. The Kansas legislature enacted laws to control Standard Oil's practices, and that prompted the U.S. House of Representatives to launch an antitrust investigation into Standard Oil. Rockefeller isn't nearly as involved in the company as he once was, but he can't help but feel that each one of these is a personal attack. In the church, Rockefeller shakes more hands as he moves toward the front door. He smiles at the parishioners, remarking on the fine sermon the preacher just gave. Soon he steps into the bright light of the summer day. He breathes in the warm air and wipes his face again. But it's then he sees a throng of people staring. Several onlookers point at him, hurling insults. Rockefeller can see the look of contempt on their faces and shakes his head. They're just filled with envy, he thinks. Envy is the only explanation for wanting to tear down successful men. Rockefeller calms himself as he surveys the crowd of onlookers. But then he sees a young man at the front of the crowd who locks eyes with him, then turns his back in a flamboyant show of disgust. There's little that can hurt Rockefeller's feelings, but this stings deeply. Of all the insults he's faced, all the ridicule, Rockefeller is most sensitive about Tarbell's cruel remarks in her latest articles. The so-called journalist called him a living mummy. She even accused him of using this church as a way to look virtuous to make it seem like he's not greedy. The implication makes Rockefeller sick to his stomach. This Ida Tarbell has no idea what true faith is or just how dedicated he is to the church. Rockefeller steps forward, protected by his two bodyguards. The men push through the crowds and finally Rockefeller reaches his carriage. He hurries inside and sinks into the cushioned seat with relief. The driver signals the horses with a whistle and the mob of onlookers disappear from view. Rockefeller stares out the window as the carriage rolls down Euclid Avenue. He tells his friends and acquaintances that he wasn't stung by Tarbell's stories, but if he's honest with himself, reading them is painful, especially the article about his brother, Frank. He's tried to guide and help Frank his entire life. He even gave him an undeserved position at Standard of Ohio, but Tarbell made it seem as if he antagonized his brother and stole Frank's stock. Rockefeller clenches his fist. Frank owed him that stock as collateral on a loan that he never paid back. Tarbell doesn't know the first thing about business, thinks Rockefeller. That's why she had to resort to personal attacks. But she does know how to turn the public against him. And of course, the politicians are responding to the public. Still, Rockefeller is not worried. These governmental investigations of Standard Oil require attention and care. They're a nuisance, but he still sees no reason for the company to change course. Standard Oil has escaped such investigations before, only to emerge stronger and more powerful. This time will be no different, Rockefeller thinks, because Standard Oil is still the biggest juggernaut in American business. Ida Tarbell can keep publishing her articles until the end of days, but nothing will stop Standard Oil. Not a ruthless journalist, not a hungry politician, not an angry mob. Because Standard Oil is here to stay. Next on American Scandal, federal prosecutors seize on Ida Tarbell's series and launch an investigation against Standard Oil that puts John D. Rockefeller in an all-out battle to protect his legacy. From Wondery, this is episode four of the breakup of Big Oil for American Scandal. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review. And be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen at free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey to tell us what topics we might cover next. You can also find us and me on Twitter. Search for hashtag American Scandal or follow me at Lindsay A. Graham. Be sure to listen to my other podcast too, American History Tellers and American Elections Wiki Game. A quick note about our reenactments. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to learn more about the breakup of Big Oil, we recommend the book Titan, The Life of John D. Rockefeller by Ron Chernow and the memoir All in the Day's Work by Ida M. Tarwell. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound designed by Derek Barrons. This episode is written by Michael Canyon Meyer. Edited by Christina Malsberger. Produced by Gabe Ribbon. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lara Beckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.